Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Somerville Licensing Commission. I'm Chair and Commissioner Joe Lynch. To my right is Commissioner uh, Christopher Allen. To my left is Commissioner John McKenna. Also joining us today is Lieutenant Bob McLaughlin from the City of Somerville Fire Department. Uh, we are awaiting Sergeant Shaley from the Somerville Police Department, but we're going to begin. And we also have, last but not least, Laurie Batsek from the City Clerk's Office. Um, today's agenda is fairly simple. The Commission has requested that the City of Somerville update this Commission on the legislation that was passed in 2018, also to update us on the zoning implications of the legislation, update us on the application by recreational marijuana applicants, update us on any and all uh, information that's pertaining to the issuance of recreational marijuana licenses. Joining us is Sergeant Warren Shaley from the Somerville Police Department. With that said, I want to uh, make sure that everyone knows that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, this is not a public hearing of the Licensing Commission. We have determined that we will not be taking public comment at this meeting, but there are multiple um, staff members from the City of Somerville that if you do have a question, I'm sure that they will uh, stick around after the meeting and answer. I've also been asked to advise you that there is another meeting this week on the 13th, and that is primarily uh, your opportunity, uh, either as applicants or advocates or uh, anything to do with the issuance of the recreational licenses, that will be your opp opportunity to give um, feedback and ask any questions of the staff. Um, uh, thank, I want to thank first off Alex Mello and uh, George Proakis and uh, Director Doug Kress from the Health Department. Those folks have done the lion's share of the work that's going to be presented. Um, I also want to make sure that uh, Wednesday's meeting is, and I'm going to look for a nod of the head from City Clerk John Long, that meeting is to be held here in the Alderman, in the Councilor's Chambers at 3. Thank you. So without further ado, you know who we are, you know what the intent of the meeting is. Um, are there any questions from the Commissioners at this point? Then I'm going to ask Alex Mello from the City of Somerville Strategic Planning Division to come up and give us a presentation. This presentation will last approximately 15 to 20 minutes. I'm going to ask the commissioners and the staff here of the commission to hold your questions until Alex is finished. Thank you, Alex. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Mello. I'm a planner with the Planning and Zoning Division of the Mayor's Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. I've been kind of working on the adult use marijuana regulations for about a year now, and uh, I'd like to share with you uh, an overview of the state legislation, and that led us to some of the municipal legislation that we've enacted and uh, present to you some procedures um, that we are going to expect potential applicants to follow as they uh, seek to open their marijuana establishment here in Somerville. So going back to 2016, where it all began when the uh, state uh, had a ballot measure approved by 53.6% of its voters, uh, which was received more favorably here locally um, by nearly 74% of voters. And that legislation, it passed in 2016 in November and the legislature uh, took some time to review it and make some modifications that made sense uh, as uh, they saw fit. And those regulations were adopted in March of 2018. Those regulations established the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission and um, as part of that, it required them to grant licenses to potential types of um, adult use marijuana establishments. And that set of regulations also gave municipalities some degree of local control, which we'll get into. And um, what's different um, with this process, one of the things is uh, with the medical process, the city executive officer, which is the mayor, was required to sign a letter of non-opposition. Uh, this time that process doesn't exist, but they kind of transferred that into a host agreement. Um, so that's going to take the place of the letter of non-opposition this time. And so, like I said, the, the legislature gave municipalities some degree of local control. It 
allowed us to either regulate through local zoning and or licensing or not at all. Um, so the city took the approach um, to, well, the difference is um, zoning allows cities to regulate the time, place, and manner of operations, and whereas licensing uh, cares more about the, as you all know, um, the operations and the people behind the organization and making sure that they follow the city rules and they're good partners in the community and they're following standards set forth by the city and state um, regulations. Um, so like I said, we passed the two types of legislation that um, the state allowed us to uh, adopt. And that was a zoning amendment by creating a new section in our zoning for adult use establishments. And um, part of that created the different types of establishments which have to do with manufacturing, retail, uh, testing facilities, research facilities, um, and we also adopt, adopted an overlay district, and that is basically, that is a map of the city where certain districts allow retailers by special permit. And the third piece of legislation that we adopted was to create a new section in the Somerville Code of Ordinances to establish a licensing ordinance. And that's, um, that'll be your job to uh, review those applications for licenses and we'll get into that. I'll start with zoning. And like I said, um, the zoning ordinance that we passed created different types of marijuana establishment uses. And these are essentially, they mimic what types of uses that the state created under their regulations. So we thought it was important to keep things consistent and um, as a zoning technicality, we drew comparisons to the marijuana types of uses to uses that we already had in our zoning. Uh, so for instance, um, we treated an independent testing laboratory as any other type of laboratory in our zoning. Uh, we wanted to keep things simple, and uh, the theory behind that is uh, marijuana is now legal in the state, so um, we were gonna treat any type of laboratory, whether they were studying the scientific properties of coffee or marijuana as the same. Um, and the same would be true for a cultivator. We are treating them like a commercial farm or greenhouse. Uh, marijuana product manufacturer, we're treating the same as any other type of manufacturing. Um, so we drew those comparisons to keep things simple. Um, the only thing that might not be as simple is the marijuana retailer, and uh, we'll get into those specific regulations uh, later. Um, so this is the marijuana overlay district that was approved. Um, we started with the Board of Aldermen with a smaller map, and as conversations occurred and the Board of Aldermen debated, um, the map kind of expanded, and what you see here is what was ultimately approved, and. Uh, this map follows our proposed zoning overhaul map where liquor stores would be allowed by special permit. Uh, one of the messages in the state legislation is to um, kind of regulate these as liquor stores are regulated. So that's kind of the theme you'll see uh, throughout some of our the zoning legislation and uh, to some degree in the licensing part. Um, so yeah, like I said, this is the districts in the proposed zoning overhaul where liquor stores would be allowed. Um, if the zoning overhaul passes, um, there wouldn't be an overlay district. There would just be uh, basically an item in the use table where uh, marijuana retailers would be allowed by special permit. And just to note, this, is on, this map is only for marijuana retailers. It doesn't apply to manufacturers or testing facilities or cultivators. Um, going, back to their, going back to the other slide, those types of uses are regulated in the same manner as um, other types of uses. Um, so some districts require it by special permit or some might prohibit it outright. So the licensing ordinance that we, uh, um, that the Board of Aldermen adopted in November, it um, gave the licensing commission the authority to approve licenses 
or not um, for potential uh, marijuana establishments. And when I say marijuana establishments, I mean every, um, every use in that list. Um, so you guys are gonna be seeing licenses for testing facilities, retailers, manufacturers, research facilities. Um, so that's, that was the first part of the legislation. It created a whole licensing process for all marijuana establishments. And there's some unique things about the licensing ordinance. It established a priority period. So for the first two years, there's two types of priority applicants that, can, that are the only two types of establish, or the only types of establishments that can receive a license in the first two years. Um, other things outlined in the ordinance are application requirements, which mimic those of the Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, the ordinance also spells out uh, an evaluation criteria, which will help the commission um, come up with the criteria for how they're going to evaluate uh, applications. And there's also uh, language in the ordinance that talks about inspection and compliance checks that are going to be done by the Health and Human Services Department, and which is in addition to those that will be conducted by the Cannabis Control Commission. So there's going to be two layers of uh, compliance checks. And um, so that led us, so once those were adopted in November, uh, the city had to start thinking about uh, procedures and, and how potential applicants are gonna move through the process and eventually um, move to the Cannabis Control Commission because in talking to the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, they tell us that they're not gonna consider any application until they get complete local approvals. So we have a procedure, we have designed a procedure that uh, kind of mimics what we did with um, the medical dispensaries, where um, the first step, which, I mean, during the medical part, the first step was to, for a potential applicant to get a letter of non-opposition from the executive officer, which was the mayor. And this time around, since they've changed that terminology to a host community agreement, um, the first step is gonna be for potential applicants to apply to get a host community agreement from the city of Somerville. So the mayor has set up a marijuana advisory committee, which is set up of, of four municipal officials, the planning director, the director of health and human services, uh, the, a deputy police chief, and the economic development director. So applicants are gonna apply for all types of establishments. They're gonna apply to that committee and that committee will review all the applications and they're gonna rank um, each application based on a set of criteria and ultimately make a recommendation to the mayor. And then it's gonna be up to the mayor who the city will um, come to terms with for a community host agreement. Um, our idea is that each host agreement is the same for each type of establishment. So all manufacturers are gonna be expected to sign the same host agreement and the same will be true for retailers. And um, so it's gonna be the same across the board. And then um, if a potential applicant is successful in getting a host agreement, then they can move on to special permitting and licensing. Now this is, um, some uses may not require special permit. Um, so uh, let's picture a retailer going through this process. If they get their host agreement, then they can move on to uh, special permitting either through the planning board or the zoning board. And that's dependent upon the underlying zoning district and also the licensing commission. We envision those processes to happen at the same time. Uh, special permitting could take anywhere from two to five months. Um, so we think it's important for those two processes to occur together uh, because it could be, if one happens before the other, it could really set a potential operator back. And if a potential applicant is successful with special permitting and licensing, then they can move on to the Cannabis Control Commission where there's a two-step process uh, called a provisional license, which is the first step. And assuming they get through that, uh, they would get the final license a few days before they're open and ready to start selling product. So I 
kind of gave an overview of the host agreement process already, but the first step for any potential applicant would be to submit an application. And um, that application is going to be available on Wednesday. Uh, it should say February 13th. My apologies for that. Um, that application is going to require a fee, site plans, elevations, and drafts of the three packets that the Cannabis Control Commission will require. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, we understand that um, as potential applicants move through the host community agreement process and special permitting and licensing, that that might affect some of the information that's in those packets. And uh, we also don't expect uh, applicants to have all of that information uh, figured out by the host community agreement step. Um, so that's why we're asking for drafts of what will be submitted to the Cannabis Control Commission. And also this application that is submitted will also serve as a licensing commission application. Um, that's gonna help expedite things and kind of uh, streamline things for potential applicants rather than filling out multiple applications throughout each step. Uh, the first application deadline will be Friday, April 5th at 12 o'clock and uh, we're gonna only accept applications electronically and this will only be the first round of applications. Um, we expect um, a, a good amount of applications to be submitted on that first deadline, um, but we're gonna also consider applications on a rolling basis every month uh, just to keep things going because um, April 5th will come fast and uh, we wanna give people the opportunity to uh, develop their ideas, their business plans, uh, some of their technical documents and we don't want them to be penalized for that. Um, so on April 5th, all the applications are gonna be compiled for the Mayor's Advisory Committee. Um, and like I said, there's gonna be a ranking criteria. Uh, that criteria will be based on location. Uh, is that a good location for the neighborhood and overall city? The physical space, is it designed well? Is it gonna function as a good retail establishment? And then third, our operations, um, are, do the operations take into account uh, city values? Are they gonna support uh, local businesses? Are they gonna have a good security plan? Um, and uh, for those applicants that the MAC deems worthy um, and um, like they might be a good fit for that potential location, uh, they may conduct interviews with each applicant and ultimately, uh, once all the interviews are wrapped up and uh, the, the MAC will ultimately provide their recommendation to the mayor, and um, if, if there are favorable recommendations that come out of the committee, uh, the city will sign a host agreement or, or not, and if there needs to be work done on a potential applicant, then uh, they can try again. They can submit and go through the process and. Um, kind of learn what the committee is looking for. So um, after that, if they're successful, they'll go to the special permit process. And um, like I said, retailers are only allowed by special permit, so any retailer is gonna have to co go through that process. And like I said, it could be either the zoning board or the planning board, uh, depending on the underlying zoning district. And that process requires a public hearing with proper notice and uh, notification to property owners within 300 feet. Uh, one thing that the special permit regulations that were adopted includes is a uh, prohibition of uh, potential retailers between zero and 300 feet from schools. And that's measured from door to door. And if there's a potential retailer between 301 feet and 500, a special finding will have to be made by the special permit granting authority that that location does not have any detrimental impact on the educational activities of that school that it's near, uh, which is very similar to liquor licenses, as you know. And um, another thing is that retailers are limited to 10,000 square feet in total. So um, that keeps things small. And uh, the uh, parking, the zoning is gonna treat the parking requirement for marijuana retailers as any other retail sales uh, establishment. 
and they will be required to submit a traffic and parking study for their special permit. And uh, the special permit granting authority will also uh, take an extra focus on having appropriate signage, meaning no sort of graphic displays of uh, the marijuana plant or anything like that. Uh, so the licensing commission, which is um, what you guys will be enforcing, like I said, there are two types of priority applicants. We're calling them Group A and Group B. These are the only types of establishments that can be issued a license within the first two years since it was adopted. And um, Group A is the has a preference between the two groups. Group A is made up of economic empowerment applicants. So those are applicants that are from areas that have been disproportionately impacted um, by um, uh, marijuana criminalization and also from, that might be from communities that, or from backgrounds that have worked with those types of populations or minority owned businesses. Um, another type of entity that has priority are entities that are at least 50% owned by Somerville residents or cooperatively owned entities where um, the, uh, the workers of that entity actually have an ownership stake in the business. And then the second type of priority applicant are the existing medical marijuana dispensaries that are currently operating in the city, which we have three of them as of today. And for the first two years, there must be an equal or greater number of active licenses issued to Group A. So um, basically, essentially the first license issued is going to be to a Group A applicant, and then um, the commission may or may not issue a license to a Group B applicant, um, as long as there's an equal or greater number of Group A applicants that hold the license. The a potential applicant would be expected to complete the application, which will be live on Wednesday. And like I mentioned before, uh, they're going to be required to submit drafts of the packets that are required by the Cannabis Control Commission. Those packets are the application of intent packet. That is basic information on who's involved in the business, the source of funding, um, where the business is proposed to operate, and it'll also signify that a community host agreement has been executed. Uh, the second piece is a background check packet. Uh, that is to ensure that the operators um, do not have any sort of illicit criminal or legal enforcement actions other than prior marijuana convictions. And the third packet has to do with the management and operations of the business, um, making sure they have liability insurance, they're in good standing with the Mass Department of Revenue, also making sure they have a good security plan, good storage, transportation, um, a good inventory system, all that stuff to make sure that they're actually a good operator. And the criteria in which the licensing commission um, will consider potential applicants is based on their compliance with state and municipal laws, consistency to community values, supporting the local economy, hiring local residents and offering competitive wages and benefits, sustainable business practices, a commitment to helping to monitor health impacts on the neighborhood of their potential uh, location, and uh, criminal records of owners of the entities except for marijuana-related infractions. Um, a lot of these questions you'll be able to have answered when they submit their application because a lot of the application questions will address the operator's qualities on these subjects. And that is all I had for now. I will be more than happy to take any questions. And as I understand, there are a lot of colleagues behind me that if I don't have the answer, I'm sure one of them will. No, they've all left, Alex. Oh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Not that we don't you. find your presentation informative, but... Uh, Thanks. Thank you, Alex Mello. Thank you very, very much. I do have two quick questions, and I'm going to turn it over to the commissioners. Um, the application, when it is submitted, yeah. electronic application only, who is that application going to? 
That's going to go to me. Um, so I'm a city planner. I'm also. I, you tried to dodge that, did you, in your presentation? <laughs> yeah. But it's going directly to you. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm also serving as the uh, Marijuana Advisory Committee liaison. So I have my email address up there. It'll also be in the application form, my email address. Uh, they can email all the materials to me, or if people prefer, they can drop them off on a CD or a thumb drive. Um, so we're going to be flexible on how we get the information, but we do requ request that they are electronic just to make things easier and um, sustainable. OK, my second question is more of a housekeeping. Um, the fees that are associated with this, uh, I was briefed um, uh, quickly before this meeting. It is the intention of this commission to take up the recommendation from um, the planning folks and the city clerk. It is my um, intention to take up those recommendations at the March meeting of the City of Somerville Licensing Commission. Okay. So, thank you. Why don't I turn it over to Christopher, Chris Allen, Commissioner Allen. Uh, first question on the uh, Marijuana Advisory Committee. Um, what is the process for that going to be in terms of are the meetings with the root potential um, establishments going to be public? Are the published recommendations going to be public? Um, yes. Um, so I, we're going to follow the similar process that we did with the uh, medical dispensaries. Um, all the applications will come in. Uh, and then once we're ready, once the committee is ready to make a recommendation, we'll kind of aggregate all the results and people will know who the um, applicant was, what the committee ranked their um, scores under each category and the ultimate recommendation. And then um, the mayor will take that information and decide whether or not the city should execute that agreement or not. Thank you. I just wanted to note that the actual meetings of the committee are not public. They're going to be meeting as they are staff, and um, they're going to be considering those privately. Uh, my next question would be on the um, number of active licenses between Group A and Group B establishments since we're comparing um, already built brick and mortar businesses and people who are potentially going to have a fair amount of construction. How are we defining an active license? Um, well, I think in, uh, I, I understand there's a difference between granting a license and issuing a license. Um, the ordinance requires there be there to be a license issued uh, to Group A applicants. Um, so as long as a business is in operation, I would consider that license being issued. Um, I believe the commission, uh, the ordinance gives the commission the right to kind of terminate any license that isn't being used or as long as once they cease operation, the license will cease to exist. I will uh, let the other, yeah. The um, Section 3 operating information where you ask the applicant what they're going to do to make this uh, heaven on earth and, uh, you know, advise against uh, the downfalls and bad things of smoking and marijuana. Will there be um, any kind of warnings uh, posted? Um, is this, uh, you're going to get a lecture when you try to buy marijuana? I mean, you're asking the applicant to, uh, you know, educate the youth keep away from down secondhand smoke, primary smoke's fine, but don't smoke in school and don't smoke in driving, you know, all this stuff. But, um, you know, I don't have to tell you what prolonged uh, marijuana can do to the brains. I mean, you're gonna have like ugly pictures of people smoking on the packages uh, like they do in Europe, uh, or what, uh, signage? Uh, yeah, I know the, the state- I mean, you, you, have a, you have a, a Board of Health um, director as one of your four um, advisors, correct? Yeah. Um, so uh, certainly he would have uh, uh, maybe an educated opinion. Maybe you want to call him up. Doug Chris. Yeah. 
Yeah, here comes Doug. Oh, oh, I'm glad he's here. I'm glad he got invited. Uh, let, let me just ask you a question before you before you start. Um, is is Brian Green um, the director of public health? Uh, no, uh, no. Dr. Green is the chair of the board of health. Chair of the board of health. That's correct. And you are? I'm the director of health and human services for the city. All right. This is this is different than 40 years ago. Okay. Well, good. You 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 can you can. Um, would you address that? Sure. My concern to that? Uh, I'd be glad to, uh, Mr. Ch through through you, Mr. Chair. I think the idea that we are looking at is we want the uh, applicants to decide how they're going to be doing their educational components. Of course, we have certain ideas that we are hoping that we're going to get by. We're not going to detail uh, every single step that we want them to take. We really want them to think what's going to fit their business model and how they're going to move it forward so that they can think about their own clients. Um, and how they're going to educate their clients on their own. But if, if as Mr. Miller says, it's like any other retail operation, well, the more they can sell, the better off their bottom line. So why would they be discouraging their, quote, um, clients or best customers? Through, you, uh, through Mr. Chair, I think that, again, we have to leave it up to the applicant to make that decision because they're the ones who are going to be doing it. We don't want to dictate uh, their educational components okay. of it. Uh, we anticipate that the CCC will probably develop some sort of materials and recommendations for that uh, at some point. So we're going to leave it to them uh, because we are following most of their guidelines when it comes to the educational component. Okay, of so this, I appreciate that this is a brand new industry mm -hmm. and that there's going to be some growing pains and learning um, steps along the way. I appreciate that. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you. Any other members? Lieutenant McLaughlin, Sergeant Shaley, I know that y you are going to be updated by your own departments on the individual components of this. All set, Commissioner McKenna? Sure. Um, I know one of the linchpins of our setup is that the host community agreements are going to be identical. Does that, um, is there any consideration towards um, just language that may not make sense for that particular establishment, namely, you know, taxes for a research establishment. Yeah, I, I don't envision us, I don't envision them volunteering. So there's not, I don't think there's gonna be any taxes generated by uh, research establishments. Uh, taxes only apply to gross sales. Um, the legislation also has strict requirements on what can be in the host agreements. Um, especially the community impact fee. That also has a maximum of 3% of retail sales. So they're not going to have any retail sales, so there's not going to be any sort of financial contribution uh, from those types of establishments. I, I think the host agreement for that would be that they're partners with the city and they're helping educate um, our youth and things like that, making sure that they understand um, negative impacts of it, things like that. That's it. Thank you. Alex, I might have missed it during your presentation. Do you anticipate, or maybe Director Prowakis wants to answer it, do you anticipate a different fee schedule for cultivators versus retail shops? Uh, so in order to apply to the Marijuana Advisory Committee, there's going to be one standard fee of $900. Um, I don't, we haven't really thought about the specific license fee um, for those types of establishments. Uh, that's something that we need to do more research on and some. But you'd have that ready for us for if we choose to bring that up in March yeah, at the regular commission. Yeah. Yeah. I think Mr. Proikis wants to add something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm George Prowikis, Executive Director of the Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development. First of all, I just want to thank you and uh, um, your assistance here as we start out into this new adventure. Um, and uh, with the uh, time and energy you spent already in uh, setting up and getting to this meeting so that our staff could uh, be here to present to you today. and. Uh, work collaboratively. I mean, we'll be working collaboratively with the health department and the police department throughout the uh, establishment of the advisory committee and, of course, with your board going forward. I think the one point I wanted to stress, because we, we've spoken a lot about this meeting about establishing, setting up, and getting a license, um, and I know you know this very well, Mr. Chair, the goal here at the end of the day is, is 
once applicants have licenses and they're up and running, the advantage of having a license is the same as anything else that your, that, that your commission licenses in that um, if there are problems, if there are issues, if there are things not going well, if uh, a complaint comes in, you can pull that entity back in front of your board, you can have a conversation with them, you can address whether or not they're holding up to the standards and expectations of the commission in terms of being able to um, um, have and operate with the license that they have. And I think that's we a refer point. to it as amend, suspend, and defend. <laughs> yes, exactly. So all of those activities, as well as the issuance of the license, all become a part of this whole process. And um, you know, we look forward. Hopefully, you won't. Hopefully, you won't see these applicants beyond them getting their license and happily wandering off and running their businesses and doing well and becoming members of our community and being successful. But I just wanted to point out that a, a piece of um, the decision to have a licensing process here also had to do with the fact that we want to make sure that we can keep keep our balance with our community partners going well, just as we do with those who hold the alcohol licenses that you uh, and all the other licenses that your commission works with today. Thank you, George. So while we have you up here, I do have a question on the timing. I know that your host agreements, you have a uh, five-year term on those, and you are expecting uh, the licenses to be issued also at five years. But as we discussed during the, um, during the preliminary legislative hearing, there is a difference for the way that once it, we give approval from the commission to the actual, let's for a safety sake, just call it the activation date, which is the issue date. And because of the time frame that's involved here between the applicant making its application to the local municipality, making its application to the CCC, executing the host agreements, there is a big lag time there. So I guess my question to you on the um, host agreement at a five-year term, um, we would consider, and this may come at a later point in the commission's hearings, um, we would consider uh, actually doing a review prior to the five-year term expiration. So as today, when we look at, um, um, Laurie, uh, 2 a.m., 2 a.m., 2 a.m. liquor licenses for restaurants that we can handle administratively at the end of the year. So we, with the help of the police department, do a review administratively. We can just grant the renewal of those licenses. Do you, and, and I'm going to ask your opinion on this. Do you think that that's something that the licensing commission should be looking at? Well, is reviewing the licenses prior to the five-year expiration. So yes, I, I, I think that's a strategy similar to that makes sense. I think establishing, as we establish the host community agreement language, um, we can establish language that basically says, you know, six months or whatever it may be prior to the expand, end of that agreement, we would like to sit and talk about where we go next on the agreements as well. Um, and make sure that we can have those conversations simultaneously. We can also set the start date of the agreement to match the date the license issues so that the they actually date. do match the five-year time frames and aren't, aren't so suddenly offset by five or six months because people are getting their other ducks in a row and getting things in order. So we can, we can make that work. Okay, thank you, George. Um, I had a couple of others, but if you have another question, Commissioner? Nope, I'm gonna find my notes. <laughs> Um, in one of the conditions, you know, the traffic and parking study, I know um, the headline stuff about oh, opening day traffic, blah, 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 blah. Oh. Is there going to be a consideration and maybe even a codification of, you know, if certain levels of lines are established requirements for these automatic, I know um, in Salem they're using an um, automatic web-based queue system, yeah. which seemed really novel. Yeah, um, I think it's beneficial having other communities have gone first and done this so we can learn from their mistakes. And uh, that's definitely one that I, as staff to the planning and zoning boards, I would look at recommending that as a condition of approval uh, for opening day. Um, and I think as more have started opening across the state, it's that impact will be diminished. Um, uh, we joked around the office when those two opened on the same day, 
uh, we were like, imagine if there were only two liquor stores in the state, what traffic would it be like? So, um, yeah, like I said, like having learned from them, that's definitely something we're cognizant of for sure. And I would, uh, I would actually require um, traffic and parking studies to consider that in, as part of their um, analysis, how they're going to manage opening day traffic. Alex, on the zoning map, if I can just ask a couple of questions on the, it appears as though that the overlay districts are heavily concentrated in the eastern part of the city. Can you just walk us through when you met with the then Board of Aldermen, now City Council? Um, it, very quickly, why is it that all of the overlay, most of the overlay, is in the eastern part of the city? Yeah, I mean, at, at first, um the Interbelt area wasn't included in the proposed overlay because we thought that this was a retail type of use and retail type uses belong in neighborhood centers and along major corridors and that's not Interbelt. Um, so that actually wasn't included. Um, but as conversations developed and their request to regulate them like liquor stores based on the zoning overhaul, uh, that proposed district allows liquor stores by special permit, um, so. So it's, fo I'm sorry, it's following along the rules of treat this product as we treat package stores. Exactly, and also as, if I can chime in as staff to the potential, as staff to planning and zoning boards, um, it's possible that the planning or zoning board may not find that Interbelt is a suitable location for a retailer. Because these are gonna require special permits. Right. Thank you. Um, when you got to the slide talking about the licensing ordinance itself, um, you used the term approve. Um, the license, this licensing commission can also deny, and we can also place additional conditions. Is that your understanding of how the CCC is allowing our participation in this? Exactly. That's a, yeah. Apologies for assuming that. Um, these are all subject to approval. We have, we have a name for that in this city. <laughs> the inspection and the compliance, and if Director Kress wants to come up, he can, but the, the inspection and the compliance checks by Health and Human Services, in addition to those that will be done, uh, done by the CCC, um, can you explain to me the role of the CCC in their compliance checks and ours? Do we perform those checks on their behalf? and then kind of tell like, them that we're okay? Um, I know that the Cannabis Control Commission has a secret shopper program where they have secret shoppers go in and they make sure they're checking IDs and things like that. And I know that um, Doug staff has a similar process, so I'll let him talk about that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are two different processes. We will not uh, we will not be expected to do the, the role of the CCC. The CCC will continue to do their inspections and all of their type of regulations as they have set forward uh, within their uh, current coding. We will be doing over and above that, so we'll be doing kind of the compliance checks as well, uh, looking at the different things, possibly looking at uh, the buying and the underage type issues that we have, um, and then we'll also be watching for uh, any of the things around uh, marketing and advertisements, um, also, we could look at the spatial part of it as well. And would you also be working with the police department directly when you do your inspections? Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I want to stay away from the word sting operations, but the way that you do it today with uh, compliance for uh, liquor stores, anyone serving alcohol, you coordinate all of that with the Somerville Police Department. Uh, for the tobacco, we do not necessarily coordinate. We do that with the alcohol ones, though. We do coordinate the, uh, okay. all of our uh, compliance checks, and that's, again, age compliance. Okay. And what I'm trying to get at is that same policy and that same structure you'd be using for cannabis, for recreational marijuana, and this licensing commission would be notified through the different channels of the city. Mainly, we get our notification through the Somerville Police Department. That is correct. You'll probably get it from both of us, not just from us, but also through yeah. the uh, police department as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, the mayor's, Alex, back to you. The mayor's marijuana advisory committee, 
Um, you did lay out, so this, this does not include any residential appoint, um, sorry, any resident appointee? That's correct, there are just four members. Uh, Doug as the Director of Health and Human Services, Sarah Lewis as the Planning Director, Tom Galagani as the Economic Development Director, and Deputy Police Chief Steve Carabino. I might be opening up Pandora's box here, but uh, was it ever considered to appoint a resident or an advocate to that advisory? Um, I, I started when the medical marijuana advisory community was already formed. Um, so when we talked about getting it back together, um, we only talked about maybe adding someone from economic development. So the advisory committee for the issuance of the medical dispensary licenses did not have someone from the medical industry, the medical industry on that. Correct. So you replicated what you did for the medical. Right. Thank you. I think I asked my other questions about the timing, um, the timing of the host agreement with the issuance of the actual license. So look, let me just off the top of my head, Alex. Um, Applicant A sends their stuff in on April 5th. They're waiting for you at the front door. And yeah. They've got it. They've sent it in electronically and they've got it. Realistically, if we are, as a city, and this commission and the CCC follows all timelines that are expected by the applicant, realistically, when's the first door going to open? Assume we get an empowerment applicant. Assume everything is okay with the CCC. Yeah, um, I don't want to make any guarantees because it all depends on how many applications we get and how many we have to sift through. Um, I mean, hopefully, I mean, maybe by the end of the summer, um, by the time they get their host agreement, go through special permitting, and go through the state licensure process, um, maybe late summer, early fall. We won't hold you to it, we're just, we're trying to get. Um, at what point, this is my last question, Alex, thanks for bearing with me. At what point are the applicants expected to have a community meeting? It kind of struck me that you were executing a, a host benefit agreement, a host agreement prior to the community agreement. Yeah, so the Cannabis Control Commission requires a community outreach 60 days before they submit their application to the state. And as part of any special permit process, we, um, once we receive an application, we inform the ward alderman, or counselor rather. And usually for projects of significance, they like to have informal neighborhood meetings. And I would suspect that would be true for something like this. Um, the reason for not doing it before the host agreement is uh, because it's really like a it's really a staff led uh, review, and w if someone gets a host agreement and the neighborhood is up in arms and they don't succeed at special permitting, then that agreement is moot. Um, so uh, the public input time is really during special permitting and licensing, and and then before they they submit their special their cannabis control commission application. Um, the CCC has um, requirements on noticing, on noticing that hearing. Uh, it has to be noticed in the newspaper and mailed to uh, abutters within 300 feet. Uh, the informal neighborhood meetings is a little, it, it's informal. Uh, it's more flyers dropped at front doors um, and it's totally up to the counselor's um, discretion how it's advertised and where it is and um, and that so yeah I would just I would just say that's probably um, just rework that wording it's not totally up to them because we also have requirements about yeah. notice to abutters uh, right. posting it on the door of the retail establishment just in case the entire yeah. public wants to know what's happening behind the doors yeah, so, yeah. I failed to mention the actual formal public hearing Correct. with the special permit granting authority and yourselves so there's multiple opportunities for public input. Okay. I know I said that was the last one, but here's the last one. <laughs> um, uh, subleasing. 
So, we, you know, the three medicals that we now have operating in the city are all um, fairly visible. They're on street level. Um, well, the entrance is street level. Um, I know the town of Brookline had a problem with uh, some of these folks, some of the retail establishments trying to operate out of a second floor, a third floor, someplace that was not visible to the public. The question that I have, though, is, um, let me just give you the example and help me understand it. Yeah. Be Fresh has a Dunkin' Donuts that shares their space. If Dunkin' Donuts goes out and one of the, one of the applicants wants to share that space with Be Fresh, do we have anything within our zoning or within our licensing that would prohibit that? Yeah, so their special permit for a medical dispensary is for the basement space. And the first condition of their special permit says that any change has to go back to the zoning board unless deemed de minimis, which is Latin for minor, by the planning director. Um, so I don't see a change like that being considered a minor change. So that would definitely have to go back to the zoning board for special permit, which means public hearings as well. Let's make an assumption then that the existing medical in Davis Square stays where they are and another applicant comes in and Dunkin' Donuts goes out and they want to go into the back of Be Fresh. Is that allowed under the zoning or is that, am I jumping the gun? Uh, sorry, a, a second entity going yes. where Dunkin' Donuts is? Yep. Um, so the zoning language does not have any sort of requirement for distances between dispensaries. Um, I can tell you that um, at one point they were, there was a proposed um, medical retailer um, that was proposing to set up in the vacant family dollar in Davis Square and it received, the neighborhood was not looking at that favorably, the fact that there'd be two across the street from one another and ultimately the entity that was proposed at Family Dollar ended up withdrawing their special permit. So if one were proposed in Davis Square, I mean in that Dunkin' Donuts site, um, I would envision that the neighborhood would also come to meetings very concerned about that. Okay, okay. Commissioner Allen. Uh, two questions, first being um, on signage and outside labeling. Um, are we limited, I, I feel like I read it in the state laws, but I can't remember. Are we limited in how we can control those on the state, le in state laws? Yeah, so the state has strict sign requirements. There can't be any sort of indications to drug paraphernalia at all. Um, we would also enforce that as well, just as, as staff to the zoning board. Um, we would definitely enforce a tasteful design and um, yeah, and basically when the zoning board approves a project, they're looking at elevations that include signage and it'll be heavily reviewed by staff and the zoning or planning board. Uh, my next question would be the theoretical scenario where we have one group A applicant and two group B applicants. Group A goes through, no problem. How do we have a procedure for determining, and let's say they both filed within the same deadline, everybody looked great, they got the same rating by the MAC. Do we have a procedure for flipping a coin? Sorry. Anyways. Um, in that scenario, um, I, as I mentioned, um, I understand there's a difference between granting a license and issuing. Uh, so if the commission thought that both Group B applicants were great, and um, I guess, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess they would have to withhold issuing one until there was a second Group A applicant, and uh, the commission would have to use their judgment on who is the better Group B applicant and who should get it first. Thank you. Any more questions? Commissioner McKenna? No? Anybody? All set? Alex, thank you very much. You know, it, it's always nice. I, I had the opportunity to go into the CCC last month. And when the chairman, uh, Steve Hoffman, said to me he really admires everything that the city of Somerville is doing, um, that's in sharp contrast to me reading the Globe about criticism of the city of Boston. So congratulations. Thank you for all the hard work that you've done. Um, Director Proegas, if you want to say anything. Thank you. 
Thank you. You do have a meeting coming up on Wednesday for the applicants here in the chamber, 3 o'clock, same time, same place? Yes, we do, and that is more geared toward the applicants asking Q&A, understanding our process, and introducing myself as the liaison to the committee. Right. And um, thank you for the kind words. Um, we're very proud of the work we've done. There's a, we have a great team of staff that's all working on this between John Long, City Clerk, George, uh, Doug Kress, uh, Summerstack, Christine Coe, Matt Mitchell in Health, uh, the Law Department. It's all hands on deck and we're very proud of the work we're doing. Love it. One more thing. Um, this is not a public hearing, but because of the open meeting law, I would appreciate if any of the audience, if you direct your questions or any comments that you have um, to the staff that's here, um, so attorneys for applicants and folks looking at zoning, uh, I'd appreciate if you not talk to the commissioners when we're leaving. All right, all set? I would just like to add, I, I grabbed a stack of business cards. If people have questions and they want to get in touch with me, come Terrific. find me. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.